Hey, good afternoon and welcome to another uh, office hours session brought to you by Infinix. So happy you could join us today. Um, we have a great topic. Hopefully you uh, saw the posting on LinkedIn. Our topic is best practices for achieving patient access operational excellence. That is a long title, um, and we're going to dive into some detail today. So, uh, again, happy you're here. We are joined by Jennifer Glockskin. Um, she is our Senior Manager of Patient Access at Infinix and has been with us two and a half years now. Good afternoon, Jennifer. Hey, Bo. Thank you guys so much for having me. Thank you for being here. Um, you want to give us a little bit of background on yourself? Sure. So before joining Infinix, like you said, two and a half years ago, I spent 20 years in a doctor's office setting um, in an array of specialties from internal med to peds, ortho, cardiology, neurosurgery, um, started out working as a medical assistant, um, grew into a surgical coordinating position, then went into a clinical coordinating position, um, and just pretty much there's nothing in an office that I haven't done. Great. It's great to hear. And I, I know from working with you that your attention to detail is, is really why you and our teams have been so successful in supporting our clients here. And, you know, that's really uh, for everybody listening today. That's what we're going to dive into. Um, insurance verification, eligibility, prior authorization, all of the disciplines that really um, define patient access and, you know, from the beginning of the journey of, of the patient engaging in their care cycle and all the way to the end where, you know, hopefully that we've helped the provider have a good experience and then generated a, a clean claim for reimbursement to continue that, that, that patient and that clinic's journey. So, um, you know, a little bit of overview of how we're going to do this today. Jen and I have gone through five or six what we call topics um, that really support um, the application of best practices when, when we're talking about patient access. So we're going to walk everybody through these topics and then Jen's going to give us some uh, really some examples and some detail on what has worked and and what um, you know she's seen uh uh, kind of be real successful in, in multiple settings. We have uh, Jen working today in the hospital settings, clinic settings, virtual uh, settings. Virtual is getting very popular. Um, so we want to talk through um, how we can be successful. So jumping right into it, uh, the first topic we wanted to talk about was patient eligibility. Um, can be a, a, a tough one um, for hospitals and clinics to nail down because we don't want to be cumbersome to the patient. We don't want to be. We don't want to bother them for all of their information the moment they hit the door. Um, that's why virtual medicine has become so popular. So, so Jen, let's just jump into it here. So, how often do you think a, a clinic or a hospital should be checking the patient's insurance? So, I think when you're talking about a clinical setting, um, I know that there are a lot of doctors who check it annually. Sometimes they do it quarterly. In my experience, uh, in an office setting, um, you really want to be checking those benefits monthly, right? Um, I, I think any more than monthly, if you're checking it multiple times in a month, is is a little bit of overwork. Um, your accumulations towards your deductible and your out of pocket, um, those only update once a month. So I think in an office visit setting, if you are verifying the pa that the patient is eligible, that doing that once a month and, and gathering those accumulations so you know whether to collect from the patient or not, if their out of pocket has been met, um, is a really great idea. I think when you venture over into the facility setting, you've got such a high volume of patients coming in that um, it's it's hard to know, have we already verified this patient every, you know, this month? So I think in a facility setting, it's really you know every patient every time, yeah. just to make All sure time. that you're not missing anything. But definitely in, in an office setting, you know, once a month, just to verify that that patient is eligible, mm -hmm. um, is, is really the best practice in that setting. Great. That's great. I, just to maybe to, to tag on to that, I wanted to you know remind all of our audience, you know, hey, remember open enrollment, it's going to start here in about a month, month and a half. And, you know, that enrollment season for Medicare, Medicare Advantage, um, new healthcare exchange uh, families will kick off. So, you know, the fall season, really late September to, to mid-December, 
real important time to remind your front office staff about performing those eligibility checks. Um, it's also a time when um, employers renew a lot of their plans. And, and, you know, you may be, especially big school districts, you may be used to having um, the same insurance every single time you go. Your clinic or facility could be located near a large university or school. Oftentimes the patient doesn't know that their health insurance has in fact changed providers and they'll give you a yeah. card that's, that's out of date. I know uh, I spent a little bit of time in clinics myself, 20 plus years. Um, and I, I, I remember uh, when we first came up with card scanners, it sounds like a silly idea, but you know, scanning that card in and making sure we've got every single one and it, it matches to the ID. So um, that's great. And then we can speak to that more if anybody has a question at the end. Um, next topic we prepped on a little bit was stat orders. Uh, we we see quite a bit where, you know, hey, um, you know, patients not feeling so great in the morning. They end up coming into the doctor's office in the afternoon. Doctor evaluates them. Fortunately, it's not an emergency room uh, situation, but in fact, they do need an urgent test, maybe same day, next day or within the week. Um, if a doctor does want a stat order for a patient, walk through for us what is required of the clinic or the provider uh, to process a successful authorization. Right. So I think the most important thing when it comes to stat orders is a delivering that order to the facility, wherever it's going and making sure that that order is complete, making sure it's got the CPT codes, it's got the diagnosis code, that you've got all of the patient information um, readily available um, for that facility if they're obtaining the auth, so they have all of that information. Coming in a close, close second to that is making sure that your clinical documentation is signed off. Um, there are some insurance companies or some TPAs who process authorizations that are diagnosis driven. So you can go ahead and go in there and put in that CPT and that specific diagnosis code and you may get an immediate approval. But what we're seeing now with a lot of TPAs is you're seeing less of that diagnosis driven um, approval and more of a clinical pathway to where we have, you know, we have to be answering questions. And it's so important that that clinical documentation, if you have a stat order, when that patient walks out the door, you want to make sure that that clinical note is signed off. So that authorization request can be initiated immediately. And whoever, whatever team is processing your authorizations has all of that clinical information readily available. Um, to, to then push that through. What, what I see sometimes um, with, with some of the uh, facilities that I work with is the doctor wants the test done right away, but then that note then isn't signed off for 24 to 48 hours. And so just knowing that that note is required in order to push that authorization through is very, very important. Got it. Um, I've also seen in my own experience, even when the doctor's note is done, the staff or the NP or the doctor's technician has completed uh, the stat order, maybe on the referring facilities, um, uh, radiology form, cardiovascular form, whatever that is. Um, sometimes the order can still be filled out um, the wrong way. So, uh, you know, when I had uh, my staff with me after we would complete the order and had all the necessary information to go get the off, we would reach out. Uh, to the facility where the patient was headed, whether it be imaging or otherwise, confirm receipt of the stat order, confirm the test that needs to be ordered. And at that time, if we had it, hand over the authorization number or similar uh, to make the receiving facility, um, you know, all the more set up for success. So, you know, again, a lot of steps um, in stat orders, but it's one thing that Infinix does well. And if we got the opportunity to partner with a new client, we could write out a protocol or a um, really we call it an SOP to help, uh, you know, streamline that process. Um, so moving right along, next topic we wanted to hit on today was really just the idea of the initial registration protocol. So, you know, whether you're registering 150 or 200 patients a day in a downtown tertiary care hospital or, you know, maybe 15 a day in a regional hospital or, or you know, large clinic, whatever that looks like, you know, registration is, is, is always as much as we've tried to do with kiosks and, and, and other pieces of modern technology today. Um, it really, at the end of the day, there's some manual work um, that has to be done and it can be error ridden. So let's jump into it. So what are a few examples of registration errors 
are, are trends that you've seen recently, you know, ultimately resulting in, in not being able to get an authorization or generate a clean claim? Sure. So I, I'm a, I am a huge advocate that your registration process, um, it, I mean, of course, that's the very beginning process of, of the whole RCM cycle, right? That initial registration where you're getting, um, you're getting all of that data necessary from the patient and whether it be the patient's going onto a portal and they're entering in their own information or you have your in, you know, your in-house staff actually processing that. I think it's important to remember that, I mean, everybody's human, right? Um, I've mistyped in my own date of birth on occasion. Um, and so when patients are looking at an ID card or you've got your staff looking at an ID card, it, it's going to happen. Somebody's going to fat finger putting it, putting in a number. And so I think something that's um, often overlooked, but very, very important is, you know, when you make initial contact with that patient for that particular service that you're rendering, making sure that you get a copy of the patient's uh, driver's license or their ID card um, so that you can confirm the spelling of their name, their demographic information, um, such as their home address, as well as um, their date of birth, which is very important. I mean, we all know you, you file a claim with the wrong date of birth, it's an instant denial. Um, and then uh, along with that, getting a copy of the patient's insurance card. Um, it's it's not uncommon with Blue Cross Blue Shield, you get your three letter alpha prefixes, somebody flips that prefix. And then when you're calling into blue card eligibility, you're providing an invalid alpha prefix. Um, it's also good practice to get a copy of both sides of the card, right? Because your the front of your card is going to have all your patient information, your ID number, your, your group number, all of that important things. But there's a lot of really helpful information on the back of that card, your customer service, your provider service. A lot of insurance companies put a direct line to their prior authorization department on the back of that card. So that means when you're going to process the authorization, you don't have to go through that provider service lines and get all the prompts. You can call direct through to that authorization department and get right where you need to be. That's great. That's great answer. Great practices in there. Um, I think a big piece to implement everything you just laid out is training. Um, we talk endlessly about training with our clients. Um, and, you know, it's interesting. We all read either a training protocol, training manual, or a PDF. Um, you know, as humans, we all read it a little bit different way. Um, and I think what we've seen uh, with our clients and a good, a great place for Infinix to jump in is we can come alongside post COVID um, with or without masks um, and do that elbow side training. Um, if, if either a doctor's office or a facility um, is either too busy, doesn't have the, maybe the labor or the available supervisors to do the training. Um, it's very important. Um, I know in my own experience, um, uh, especially when I worked uh, at non-for-profit hospitals, the registration team had to do a uh, hundred registrations without error before you were allowed to do one on your own. And so, you know, it sounds so silly to just talk about some of the regimen involved in that, um, but it's very, very important um, that that your registration staff takes each and uh, each and every opportunity uh, have that authentic opportunity to get all the information in correctly the first time. Um, you know, within a lot of practice management systems and EMRs today, um, you can install software that can also go through and make sure everything matches up. And we also would recommend a supervisor audit uh, periodically. Um, the registration process um, as CMS is constantly changing rules and updating rules. Um, so if a patient needs an ABN or some other type of um, information, you can ingrain that also um, into your registration protocol and Infinix can, can work in opportunities to help with that type of training. So again, that initial registration protocol is, is really where the errors start. Um, and so happy to help along with that. Next topic we wanted to jump into is, is a little uh, more at the macro level. And um, Jen spends a lot of time uh, with our facility partners um, helping the various departments, either inside of a facility, maybe inside of a large clinic, say a hundred provider type clinic, um, helping the departments work together 
right? From the moment the patient engages us via some request for an appointment all the way until they either get their stat order, their procedure, or whatever it may be. So um, we were calling this one department playbook collaboration. Every facility or, or, or every clinic really should have a playbook um, that they're following for the registration um, and then the authorization eligibility process leading all the way to, to generating the claim at the end. And so, Jen, as you, as you think about your experience over the past couple of years, we wanted to get into what is the best way to get all the departments on the same page to perform their select role in the eligibility and auth process. So I think, like you said, just having that that standard operating procedure, right? That that we treat every patient, every order, we we treat it all the same, right? It, everything goes through the same process. Um, once you start circumventing the process um, for uh, for specific instances, th those that's where things fall through the cracks, right? So having that set process. Um, you know, is, is that first line defense that everybody knows I have to do the same thing every patient, every time. I'm also a huge proponent of, you know, when, when you have have it broken down as many offices and many facilities do, um, you know, you've got your team doing registration. You've got one team doing insurance verification and eligibility that may be tied into your, your authorization team. And then you've got your scheduling team over here. And I think that it is very important, not only teaching um, an employee their part in the process, but giving the employee a good understanding of the entire Higher process under so then they can then understand how their part in the process can affect downstream right so teaching these people in registration hey you know when when you're putting in an insurance id number you know if you're doing this over the phone with the patient read that number back to the patient have the patient confirm that the information that you have is correct because if what we put in initially into the system isn't correct, then as we go down down the stream, right, you can't verify, you're not going to get insurance verification if you don't have the correct date of birth. Um, you know, if, if somebody is putting in, you know, an incorrect insurance company, if they're putting in commercial Humana as opposed to Humana Medicare, you know, these, these are different avenues that everybody has to go through. And so just having everybody understand how that affects the process downstream. I, I see in a lot of the facilities that I deal with, you know, a, a lot of times um, your intake or your registration and your insurance verification and your authorizations, they don't always necessarily have direct patient contact, right? There's nowhere for the patient to call and say, hey, where's my authorization at in the process? Generally, that first point of contact is going to be your scheduling department. Mm -hmm. So there's um, in, in the scheduling departments that that I work with, you know, you get a lot of feedback from your scheduling team. You know, a patient's going to call in and they're going to be upset because they haven't been contacted to schedule yet. And, and so all that person can say is, you know, I'm sorry, it's, it's in the authorization process. We can give you a call back. But that scheduler is the one who gets that that feedback sometimes angry feedback from you know from the patient or the the you know the referring provider's office um and and then that has to be escalated but but you see um how that then you know what registration does it, it trickles all the way down to the scheduling process yeah. and and so i think it's very important for not only not only to understand my part in the process, but to understand how my pro part of the process affects everybody else in the process, I think is very important when it comes to training a team. That's great. Um, so, you know, maybe just to dive a little deeper on that one, um, can you think of an example of, you know, maybe when you've either been in a facility or maybe been in a clinic um, where, in fact, maybe you have called all of the department, either the department leads or the department heads or the managers all together. And if so, when you when you get those that kind of group together, um, what is it that you want that group to focus on to work better together as a team? Well, I think um, I, I mean, I've 
I've actually done this very recently. Yeah. Um, and, and it's one of those things where, again, just understanding what the process looks like. We, right. we, I think we all get so involved in our part of the process mm -hmm. that it's, it's hard to see outside of our purview. Um, and it could be things, you know, just things like, you know, Hey, we've got this order, but the order doesn't have a, a, a CPT code on it. And, you know, as uh, somebody filling the role of an authorization specialist, right? Okay, they're not certified coders. You want them to be more clinical than anything so that they can understand what they're doing. Um, and so, you know, what ends up happening is when these things, when, when the process isn't followed accurately, what ends up happening ultimately is there's a delay in patient care right? The patient is the one who ends up suffering because we didn't get a proper ID number or we didn't get a good phone number or, you know, these types of things. It, it, it really t affects downstream. And, and ultimately what happens there, it's not necessarily about the, the issues that my team runs into so much as on the other side of this whole process, there's a patient. There is a person who has a, a situation going on with themselves and, and to any patient, what's happening to me is immediate, right? That's, that's emergent because it's happening to me. And, and so to just understand that making sure that, that we've got all of the correct information to best serve the patient. That's great. That's great. And, and just driving that accountability, reinforcing that accountability, kind of department by department. And again, we're as strong as our, you know, weakest member at each of our departments. Right. So making sure that he or she has all the training pro protocols in front of them um, and has a, uh, feels comfortable and has a, 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 an open and unintimidating environment to ask questions um, and say, hey, I, I don't exactly know what to do with this part of it. Can somebody assist me here? I've run into that a lot in my own career where, you know, people with if they don't know the entire process, they'll they'll kind of rummage their way through it and it'll end up doing more harm uh, than good. So, you know, I think as managers and leaders in the RCM space, we, we need to understand that everybody's in a learning journey um, and where everybody's at is a little bit different and we've got to be patient. So that's well, and I think, And I, oh, I was just going to say, but I think with that, I think that it, particularly when it involves training, yep. right. To, to, to make sure that your training program is multifaceted right? Some people learn by seeing, some people learn by hearing, some people learn by doing. So having a multifaceted approach where I'm going to show you yeah. and then I'm going to allow you to do. And then, like you said, having those protocols in place where you've, you've got to complete so many all the way through without any errors. So just a very multifaceted training program is, is, very necessary. It was great. Um, you know, kind of our, our last topic that we want to hit on today is we've talked a lot about what the best practices are. Um, and now we thought we'd spend a minute or two talking about actually how to install them, or really like how to get them from just talking about them to, to doing them. So um, yeah, as you're thinking about your experience, um, how can we or how have we in the past helped clinics and facilities um, install some of these best practices that will ultimately help their revenue. And, you know, we wanted to hit on correct information, selecting codes, having a clear understanding, maybe just talk, walk us through a little bit about how this stuff actually gets installed with a team. Right. So I think uh, particularly with, with my team in general, I think what I see a lot in a lot of offices um, and a lot of facilities is there's a large focus on quantity, yeah. right? We, we want to push out as, as you know, we want to schedule as many patients as possible. We want to do as many aughts as possible. We want to push out as many claims as we can in a day. Um, with my team personally, I focus on, I want quality, right? Because if we're not pushing out quality things, all we're, all we're providing for ourselves is additional work down the road, or additional work for somebody else down the road, right? It's better to push out a clean claim the first time around, right? So what I teach my teams is always double check your information. It takes an additional 30 to 45 seconds to take an addition, you know, to look back at that insurance card, look back at that ID. Did I put all of the information in there correctly, 
right? So, and then as for your authorization teams, you know, are you going to the correct TPA to, to process those things? Are you making sure that you're, you know, not transposing numbers on the codes? Do we have the correct diagnosis codes? Um, another thing is, you know, when processing authorizations, there are certain um, diagnosis codes that provide you an easier clinical pathway, right? So to, to have a team experienced enough then to um, read through those clinicals and say, okay, well, you know, we're, we're doing the particular thing for, for diagnosis A, but that is a much more difficult clinical pathway to get through. So if I read through the clinical information and I see that that there is another diagnosis that's noted in that patient's chart that's documented in that visit that's going to give us a, a faster, cleaner pathway to get that authorization, then we should be using that. And 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 all of those things, you know, having a crosswalk to reference and say, okay, this insurance company processes through this, this TPA yeah. um, and, and, and ways, you know, helpful hints for the team to get through those. But I'm always a big proponent of, you know, um, I, I see a lot of facilities where they just make the assumption that, oh, this is Blue Cross. So it's going to go through Carillon for their authorization request. Um, only to find out that something has changed and updated. Um, and so, you know, never just taking what a TPA tells you um, as gospel, right? Because they're just a third party. So to always go back to that home plan and confirm that information. Um, and then one, one last thing that I always impress on my team is, is we work in an industry that changes rapidly and often, Right. So we never make the assumption that we are 100 percent sure about anything. Um, one code that didn't require an auth in the beginning of the year. Um, now, after July 1st, I mean, we've seen this with the with the changes in CMS and their guidelines and, and things that previously did not require authorization, um, like your facet joint injections are now requiring an auth. So to never just. Um, say, oh, well, I know this for sure, because again, things rapidly change in in, in the industry that we're in. And, and so we need to be constantly re-educating ourselves throughout the process. That's great. That's great. Well, um, that concludes our, uh, our detailed session today on really how to achieve that operational excellence we want in the patient access space. Um, if you've got a question, you can put it in the chat and we'll give it kind of a minute or two. Um, and um, if you don't want to ask a question today, um, you can always follow up on our website um, and we'll have somebody reach out to you. And um, Jen and myself are accessible and we can talk through any challenge you might be having and see if there's an opportunity there for us to help out. So Jen, thanks again today for all of the insight and uh, look forward to uh working with you and, and having the opportunity to help clients as we move forward. Thanks again. Wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. Okay. Bye-bye.